Hi, uh, first, um, thank you uh, to the organizers and AIM and Mike uh, for the opportunity to actually speak on the issue. Uh, I'd like to uh, make several points before starting the discussion. Uh, one, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge uh, uh, Senator Shan actually. Uh, she was very modest, but I have to, I have to say this, that uh, Senator Shan is really the, the real mother of uh, the archipelagic basin. So I think she was very modest in her presentation, but her advocacy and her determination actually was the inspiration. She mentioned that she was the first one to actually try to break the barrier of trying to harmonize the rest of the world. And it was true. And uh, she did, it, did this with a lot of courage. She never stopped, even if it was not passed. And that dedication actually carried over through the various committees and people and groups who were. So I, I, I don't like that to get lost in history. <laughs> Uh, uh, second, uh, I, I think I was asked to, do, to speak on the cooperation, but you see, cooperation does not come about from a vacuum. It's so much interrelated, it's secure. And so I will try to make some discussions of that. But I'd like to, pre uh, before proceeding there, I'd like to make certain caveats because I'm, I'm from government and therefore the useful caveats I will say. But I will say that it's a modified caveat, that I'm here with a personal disclaimer, but it's modified in the sense that if I say something right, you can attribute it to my government. <laughs> if, I, if I say something bad, it's mine and mine alone, as my personal way. Uh, secondly, I'd like to, I don't think, uh, I'd like to also say that to shed off you know, I will bore you if I'm going to tell you about the use of diplomatic language, and I don't think we're here for that. So to allow me to speak a little more frank and candid, but not too deep, actually, I will invoke the Chatham House rules, uh, which actually means that you can use uh, the, uh, the points, but do not attribute it to, to anybody. That being said, therefore, let me go over with the presentation, and I'd like to preface this presentation with the following points. Uh, one, I'd like to emphasize that we would like to, that China and the Philippines are bound by geography. We don't choose our neighbors. Uh, uh, we, it is something that is imposed on us. And this is something, a factor, an element that we have to work on. And therefore, it is imperative that we have to generate that relationship with China. And there are so many reasons. I'm not going to exemplify and amplify and explain that a little further. I, we would like to walk 100 years of peaceful stability in China. But for that 100 years of relationship to really move forward in that direction of peace and stability, I think it's very important that it must be founded on solid fundamental principles of equality. Equality and mutual respect of each other's sovereignty and dignity. It is very difficult to shake hands with somebody and smile if his food is on my food. Maybe for that handshake to be really genuine, you have to take your food off my food. And this is what we're trying to say. Uh, and I will amplify on this, and that food actually is the nine dash line. Uh, and I will go into this later on in more substance. My second point uh, to preface. The tension in the South China Sea is not generated by the Philippine articulation. The, the articulation is a reaction. The tension is generated by something else. All right? There is a cause and effect. And tension does not generate the tension. It is a reaction of the tension being brought forth in the very doorstep of the Philippine archipelago. And what is that tension? What is the cause of that tension? I think this analysis is very important because it, by analogy, let me make a little bit of analogy with a, with a, with a toothache. If you're experiencing ache in your tooth, you normally take a palliative measure by taking a pain killer. Sure, it will affect maybe eight hours, but if you neglect the very source of the ache, which is the decay, eventually you're going to lose that tooth. And this is what we're saying. And this is the very reason why we are articulating. Because this issue is what which we have tried to skirt from for many years is something that we have to put on the table and face up squarely. Because we don't like 
these uh, causes of the tension to perpetuate and generate future conflict. Because addressing them 10 years from now is going to be very, very difficult. We have to address it at a time when the countries are in a position of flexibility. Actually. So having said this, therefore, let me go to the presentation. In making this presentation, I'd like to take off from the from the initial video presentation. I think in the initial video presentation uh, uh, by Attorney Batumbaka, he elaborated on the disputes. And it is that where I want to take off uh, in the discussion. Uh, can you show the next slide? Actually, let me represent in a different way the presentation by, by uh, Jay. Actually. You see, this is the South China Sea. And you will see Philippines, Vietnam, Hainan, China, uh, Spratly, Sparsos, Taiwan up there, Borneo, Brunei, Malaysia. When you look at the South China Sea, you see a lot of lines. That explains the problem in the South China Sea. The crisscrossing lines represent the problem. And I think Jay uh, explained this earlier with the 200, for example, this is the 200 nautical miles. So it's a combination of both territorial and maritime disputes. All right, maritime disputes generated by these overlapping maritime claims. Territorial dispute has something to do with the question of who is the owner of the features. These are two distinct things. Yet, when you see all these lines crisscrossing each other, they represent the problem. Why? For if those lines intersect with each other, they represent the conflict, the dispute. Essentially. But this is not enough, actually. What it tells you is the imperativeness of dealing with the issue. But yet, there is a time element. It is also urgent. Why? Because certain territorial disputes and maritime disputes, they could be benign. Right? And I can mention to you several disputes that have been so benign for many years, and that therefore never creates that urgency. If this is a benign dispute here, we could wait for another hundred years, all right? But the fact of the matter is that there is not only imperativeness in addressing the matter, there is also urgency. Urgency, why? Let me show, show you why. Next slide. All right, beginning in the 70s, all right. Beginning in the 70s, we saw the first incident with one party over the par parcels being forced out by force, actually, from, from the features in parcels. Then later on, a decade after, in the 80s, another incident in the fiery cross reef in this practice. Then a little, a decade again in the 90s, beginning 94-95, another incident again at Mischief Reef. Then a decade more, the first decade of 2000, what do we have? The problem of Reed Bank, areas three and four, all within our maritime entitlement of 200. Then in the second uh, decade of, of 2000, we have the Scarborough, or Baudi Masido, and uh, middle of this year, we have the nine blocks from China, from Vietnam. All right. So what does the what does it tell us that the dispute here is not benign? It's very active. That there is somebody moving in that direction with real capability of enforcing that right, supposed uh, quote unquote right. Uh, and so it creates therefore the urgency of putting in place an architecture that would actually not only that will manage these disputes from developing it into a pure conflict. This is what dispute settlement, this is what conflict avoidance is all about. Second, uh, Secretary Alunan did, did mention about cooperation and the reason why those cooperation is not moving forward. This is also the reason. To amplify on that, the crisscrossing lines actually operates to be a grid line. In a way, we have come into a gridlock because of those crisscrossing lines, actually. And therefore, it prevented us from moving forward full blast. All right. 
So my third point in presenting this, therefore, is this. Having seen, looking at this diagram or this slide, therefore, the lines also gives us a clue on how to approach and manage the issue. What does that mean? If the lines represents the points, the, the points of intersection, uh, for example, the overlap here, the overlap with Indonesia, the overlap with, uh, on this area, the overlap here, if you're able to at least reduce those lines, then you are heading in the right direction. So the trick, therefore, is, and the challenge for everybody is, how can we reduce those lines? In this context, therefore, the Philippines has tried, over a period of time, tried to create uh, and formulate certain initiatives that it thinks would try to minimize and reduce these lines. But it is important to note that before you can actually reduce these lines, it all starts with your own house clean, cleaning, right? of overlapping maritime entitlements, it begins with a clarification of what an individual state is actually claiming. If a state is not so clear as to what it claims, it's very, to the, uh, it's very difficult to actually discuss maritime delimitation. And so it is a priori, a condition uh, sine qua non, a necessary condition for each of the states here to actually define and clarify their own claims. Not only that, clarify their claims consistent with international law. Why? Because if you have no international law, there's no anchor, there's no standard, then each to his own. And if it is each to his own, it is mine that will govern. But that is not how the international community is actually structured. We don't want that because that breeds chaos and anarchy. And that's why we call ourselves International Community of Nations because we believe in that tie that binds us all. And what is that? International law. And so therefore, that clarification has to be in accordance and consistent with what we call international law. And if we're talking of law of, of the sea, therefore, we're talking of a very specific branch of international law, which is UNCLOS, actually. And this is what we're saying. So, in the case of the Philippines, and, and, and therefore, this is to give you an idea what has been the Philippines doing over a period of time. As I said, nothing happens now from a vacuum. All of these are part and parcel of an overarching policy and strategy. And that's why there is in place what we refer to as Philippine Maritime Security Strategy, which actually puts a roadmap in terms of the specific steps that this country ought to do. And if you are going to say rules-based approach, rules-based rules -based means it starts with us trying to harmonize our very own law. It is very difficult for any country to invoke international law when your own domestic law is inconsistent with what you are preaching. So it starts with you. You have to be able to uh, uh, practice what you preach. And so what does that mean in terms of the Philippines? And so we try to actually try uh, blaze a trail or set the tone or generate the momentum for each and all of the countries to actually follow the path of international law. There is no other way. The other way for us is to settle things by force. And so beginning, for example, in 2006, all the way, of course, it began with uh, S Senator Shahani and we carried it over. Finally, we were able to actually do pass the archipelagic baselines law by aligning, essentially, declaring ourselves as an archipelagic state. I think Senator Shani explained, explained it very well, so that we're not a scattered, fragmented archipelago. And so we developed that. So by 2009, we actually passed 9522. And it was very significant in two, two ways. One, uh, we have made our baselines law fully consistent, 100% with UNCLOS. Second, we have somehow given the idea of how the Spratlys can be approached. All right? from, uh, from, from a polygon box, we have treated Spratlys in the concept of regime of islands. Later on, I will explain the significance of this, why that 
that act in 2009 has significance in the things that are happening now, actually. But let me explain. By putting our house in order, uh, clarifying ourselves, it now allows us to address our maritime overlapping, sorry, it's not working, <laughs> uh, our overlapping uh, maritime entitlements. This will now allow the Philippines to engage its neighboring countries for purposes of delimiting their maritime overlaps. For example, in the case of Indonesia, So in the case of Indonesia, you will see the yellow dotted line there. That is the theoretical median line. Because, you see, international law in terms of these matters also prescribes uh, ways and means by which you can actually approach this. And so it has, for example, established the concept of median line or it distance as a way of delimiting your space. So it begins with the southern part going through the eastern part, the eastern seaboard, all the way to the north. That therefore addresses the eastern seaboard. And hopefully whatever momentum is generated on the eastern seaboard will carry over to the western seaboard, actually. And therefore we are now only left with the problem of the South China Sea, actually. So in effect, talking about my multilateral and bilateral, with respect to those maritime overlaps with specific countries, they, have, they can be addressed bilaterally, right? And so that is what we're trying to do. Now, and at, at this hour, I must say that we have people working on, together with our Indonesian colleagues, how to settle this matter. So this is something that's actually ongoing quietly. Moving therefore, so therefore we're left with only one problem, the South China Sea, which is a more complex situation. How do we apply the concept of delimitation and how do we actually try to reduce the line sea? Earlier I said it started with us declaring it under the concept of regime of islands, right? That gives us a clue therefore that they have to be treated individually and in a very peculiar, unique way. The point here is this. Uh, and this leads me now to a very specific initiative that the Philippines has put forward actually as a way of solving this problem, which is what we refer to as the zone of peace, freedom, friendship, and cooperation.